Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind adjust the theme, crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, New East St. Augustine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Philip M. Aguale. The fundamental problem of supercomputing was to discover how to solve the toughest problems arising in mathematics science and engineering and to discover how to solve those grand challenge problems across an ensemble of processors that were identical to each other and that shared nothing between each other with each processor operating its own operating system the latter was the biggest scientific question in the unknown world of the supercomputer. The concrete, measurable and visible proof that I was in the terra incognita or in the unexplored territory of the supercomputer was that it made the news headlines that I experimentally parallel processed and communicated across a new internet. After my invention of practical parallel processing, I became well known, but not known well. That is, many knew Philip M. Aguale as an inventor, but few understood his invention. It's easier to recognize my face than to understand my abstract contributions to mathematics, physics, and computer science. Who is Philip M. Aguale? I am the computational mathematician that contributed to a greater understanding of how to execute the fastest floating point calculations of arithmetic. I am the research mathematician who figured out how to solve the largest system of equations of algebra that must be solved to discover and recover otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas. I am the mathematician that invented new partial differential equations of the calculus of extreme scaled petroleum reservoir simulation. For those reasons, I said that I am well known as a supercomputer scientist that contributed to the development of the computer, but I am not known well as a mathematician that contributed to mathematics. It's easier to understand that I contributed to the modern computer or to the modern supercomputer that's an internet than to understand my contributions to computational mathematics and even computational physics. Most people think calculus is difficult to understand. The invention of the fastest computer is easier to recall than the invention of the most advanced expression in calculus that in turn is the recurring decimal in nearly all the workloads of supercomputers. A 12-year-old writing a school report, a school inventor report on Philip M. Aguale cannot explain to her teacher how the new nine partial differential equations that I contributed to calculus 
is more accurate than the previous equations in textbooks. On the other hand, she could explain my contributions to the development of the supercomputer that is a new internet. The technology called practical parallel processing that I discovered on the 4th of July 1989 was called a grand challenge for a good reason. Because it was once impossible, it was a once impossible problem that was in the realm of science fiction. The machinery was abandoned by 25,000 supercomputer scientists that were only at home with scalar and vector processing. I was the only full-time programmer of the 1980s that was at the frontier of the most massively parallel supercomputers. In the 1980s, attempting to harness 64 binary thousand processors and to use them to solve the biggest scientific challenges evoked a sense of foreboding. In the 1980s, harnessing one billion processors that defined and outlined a massively parallel supercomputer and using them to solve a grand challenge problem was as science fiction as sending an astronaut to planet Mars. In the 1980s, to parallel process a grand challenge problem was to make the impossible to solve. Initial boundary value problem of calculus and physics possible to solve as a discretized problem in large-scale algebra. The reason I parallel processed alone was that I was the only person with the confidence to do so. In the 1970s and 80s, practical parallel supercomputing across a new internet that was a new global network of 65,536 processors was like shooting at as many birds in the dark. I parallel processed to discover speeds in computation and communication that were previously unseen and that made the news headlines in 1989. Supercomputer scientists that had seen me daily in the 1980s first read about my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing and read about it in newspapers instead of hearing about my discovery from me. For me, as a lone supercomputer scientist, Breaking the speed, the speed records in both computation and communication and breaking those records alone and breaking those records for the first time and breaking those records with a parallel processing machinery was the metaphorical, equi metaphorical equivalence of being the first solo mountain climber that climbed to the peak of Mount Everest. The significance of reaching the top of Mount Everest and being the first person to reach it was an achievement in geographical exploration that redefined the boundary of the reachable regions of the Earth. I was in the news headlines because I was the first lone wolf supercomputer scientist to climb to the peak of the Mount Everest of massively parallel supercomputing across a new ensemble of 65,536 tightly coupled commodity of the shelf processors that shared nothing between each other and that were equal distances apart from each other. Prior to my experimental discovery of practical parallel supercomputing, and my discovery of how to solve a grand challenge problem 
and how to solve it across a new internet. The fastest computations were recorded on the scalar supercomputers of the late 1940s through early 1970s. The fastest computations were also recorded on the vector supercomputers of the mid-1970s through late 1980s. I first entered into the world of scalar supercomputing on June 20, 1974, at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, United States. That scalar supercomputer solved only one initial boundary value problem of calculus at a time. The ensemble of 65,536 processors that I programmed in the 1980s and programmed as a new internet and that made the new set lines in 1989 solved 65,536 initial boundary value problems at once. Initial boundary value problems of calculus are at the foundation of computational physics. Nine in ten supercomputer circles consumed in the 1980s we are consumed by extreme scale computational physicists extreme scale high resolution computational physics is executed across a massively parallel supercomputer that occupies the space of a soccer field for that reason computational physics is a branch of physics that lies between theoretical and experimental physics. That is, computational physics is the third branch of physics. That branch of physics is midway between theory and experiment. That branch of physics encompassed both theory and experiment. My experimental discovery of how to solve many initial boundary value problems that are governed by a system of partial differential equations of calculus and governed by its companion and discretized system of partial difference equations of algebra. And my discovery of how to solve them at once opened the door to the parallel supercomputer that is the world's fastest supercomputer that achieves its record-breaking supercomputing speed by solving millions upon millions of initial boundary value problems and solving them at once. In computational physics, my experimental discovery made it possible for the supercomputer of today to reduce the time to solution of the biggest scientific challenges and reduce it from 10.65 million days or 30,000 years to just one day. Without parallel supercomputing, a global warming prediction will occur 30,000 years after the said global warming occurred. My quest for the fastest speeds in computing demanded that I parallel process across a new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. In the 1980s, massively parallel processing defined the boundary of the supercomputer. The reason I am well known but not known well was that I was the first person to enter into the terror into the unexplored territory where the fastest computations can be executed across a new internet. The proof that I entered into that unexplored territory was that I recorded speeds 
in supercomputing that we have previously unrecorded. That contribution made more news headlines than any singular contribution made by an individual to the development of the computer. In the 1970s and 80s, the complete knowledge of the parallel supercomputer was out of the reach of human beings. That is, I parallel processed in that new frontier of knowledge and did so without a map or a textbook. On the 4th of July, 1989, I became the first person to provide practical, in-depth, and easy-to-understand explanations of how to harness millions of processors and how to use those processors to solve a real-world problem that is chopped up into millions of smaller problems. My invention of practical parallel supercomputing made the news headlines because I also discovered how to harness the new supercomputer to solve grand challenge problems that will otherwise that will be otherwise impossible to solve. In the history of computing, the invention of parallel supercomputing is the biggest change in the way we think about the supercomputing, supercomputer. In the old way, the fastest supercomputer solved only one problem at a time or in sequence. In my new way, the fastest supercomputer solved 10 million problems at once or in parallel. I was in the news because I discovered how to experimentally perform 65,536 synchronized parallel communication that was as many times faster than your email. The supercomputer that I programmed in 1974 only computed sequentially and did so with, within only one central processing unit. The virtual supercomputer that I programmed in the 1980s computed in parallel and did so in the plural senses and communicated across a new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. Who invented the internet? The internet has many fathers and mothers as well as aunts and uncles. We can only have one father of the internet that invented a new internet. The father of the internet should at least invent a new internet. I am called a father of the internet because I am the only father of the internet that invented a new internet. I invented my new internet by first to raising it back in 1974 and then continuously developed it for the subsequent 15 years and developed that small copy of the internet and did so until I actualized it as the fastest computation back on the 4th of July 1989. My two raised to power 16 commodity of the shelf processors we are tightly coupled to each other and we are equal distances apart from each other. I mathematically visualize my 64 binary thousand processors as tightly encircling a hyperglobe that is bounded by the hypersurface 
of a 16-dimensional hypersphere that is embedded within a 16-dimensional hyperspace. I visualized the physical and mathematical domains of my extreme scale high resolution general circulation model as the 62 mile deep hyperspherical shell that was bounded by two hyperspheres. The inner hypersphere has a diameter of 7,900 miles that corresponded to the surface of the Earth. The outer hypersphere has a diameter of 7,962 miles that corresponded to the outer boundary of the atmosphere of the Earth. I visualize the two raised to power 16 vertices of my hypercube to be midway or 31 miles between those two hyperspheres. I drew parallels between my new internet that was a new global network of processors and how I envisioned simulating global warming. My two hyperspheres were parallel to each other. My two hyperspheres extended in the same direction. My two hyperspheres never converged or diverged. My 65,536 processors were paralleled with respect to the climate model that I divided into 65,536 smaller climate models. Those climate models we are identical in domain size. My discovery of practical parallel supercomputing created a paradigm shift on how we look at the computer and the internet of tomorrow. Practical parallel supercomputing led to my new definition of the supercomputer as powered by millions upon millions of processors rather than one singular processor. Practical parallel supercomputing was mocked, ridiculed, and rejected during the 67 years onward of its first conceptualization that occurred in print back on February 1, 1922. After my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989, the supercomputer industry took my invention and made it the vital technology within every supercomputer. But for the 67 years prior to my invention, practical parallel supercomputing remained in the realm of science fiction. My contribution to the development of the computer is this. I upgraded the parallel supercomputer from science fiction to non-fiction. I discovered how to maintain a one problem to one processor correspondence or analogy between the smaller general circulation models and the processors. I discovered how to communicate synchronously and how to compute simultaneously, and how to communicate and compute and do both 65,536 times faster and do both on 65,536 central processing units and across 16 times as many email paths. In other words, I paradigm shifted in my email communication across my new internet, I discovered how to harness processors and how to shift from the singular person-to-person -person email to the plural processor-to-processor -processor emails that I synchronized across my new internet.
that is a new global network of 65,536 tightly coupled central processing units. That new global network defined a parallel supercomputer that is a new internet de facto. I invented a new internet that tightly encircled a hyperglobe. My hyperglobe is shaped like a 16-dimensional hypersphere in a 16-dimensional hyperspace. My supercomputing paradigm shifted because I computed simultaneously on 65,536 central processing units and emailed synchronously across one binary million email wires. That was how I discovered that practical parallel processing must be vital to the supercomputer that solves many problems at once or in parallel. That invention of practical parallel supercomputing embodied the Philip M. Aguale formula that then US President Bill Clinton praised in his White House speech that was delivered on August 26, 2000. President Bill Clinton recognized my contribution to the development of the parallel supercomputer in part because it made the news headlines 11 years earlier. That contribution was my experimental discovery of how to record the fastest computations and how to record those fastest computations and record them across a parallel supercomputer. I recorded those fastest computations by solving 65,536 problems at once instead of solving only one problem at a time. I'm often asked, what is Philip Emma Aguale known for? My answer is this. I am the only father of the internet that invented a new internet. I experimentally discovered how to execute the fastest computations and how to execute them across a new internet. That new internet is a new global network of processors that we are tightly coupled to each other. I visualize the processors of my new internet to be equidistant from each other and to be evenly spread out across the surface of a globe that I also visualized as embedded within a 16-dimensional hyperspace. In my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing, I used my new internet to, redef to redefine the boundary of human knowledge of how to execute the world's fastest computations and most importantly, harness that supercomputer speed to solve the toughest problems arising in science, engineering, and medicine. My experimental discovery of practical parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989, of how to reduce the supercomputer time to solution of grand challenge problems and reduce it from 180 years to just one day, in effect, distinguished between what's computable and what's not computable. Climate models must be used to accurately foresee otherwise unforeseeable long-term climate changes. In theory, Extreme-scale, high-resolution climate models are computable. But in practice, a climate modeler may need to run more than a thousand accurate simulations. If each accurate simulation 
of the planet's climate has a time to solution of 180 years. Then the climate modeler that began her simulation two millennia ago, or in the year Jesus Christ was born, will complete her forecast in nearly 2,200 millennia from now. I was the first computational physicist to experimentally discover how to parallel process across an internet. I was in the news headlines because I discovered how to parallel process extreme scaled computational fluid dynamics codes and how to simultaneously execute them in parallel and how to synchronously email them across a new internet. I was the first person to experimentally discover how to reduce 180 years of time to solution of a grand challenge problem being solved on one computer to just one day of time to solution across a new internet that is de facto one supercomputer. That new internet is a new global network of 65,536 identical central processing units that I visualized as equal distances apart from each other and on the surface of a globe that I mathematically visualized as embedded within a 16-dimensional hyperspace. Along my way to that terra incognita, called parallel supercomputing that was in then was then an unknown and unexplored territory that had no map i employed a system of coupled nonlinear time dependent and three dimensional partial differential equations of calculus that encoded a set of laws of physics including the second law of motion I use those partial differential equations to formulate 65,536 initial boundary value grand challenge problems. I discretized those grand challenge problems of calculus to obtain a set of linear equations of extreme scale algebra. I reduced calculus to algebra because algebra is the only way the supercomputer can experience the laws of physics. Those linear equations were the old, at the algebraic core of my extreme scale computational fluid dynamics codes. I executed my 65,536 codes in parallel and across as many tightly coupled processors in a manner of speaking, I used those 65,536 processors, processors to poke my nose into the laws of physics and to discover how the millions upon millions of processors that powers the modern supercomputer can be harnessed and used to foresee the otherwise unforeseeable climatic changes. I discovered that I can use those 64 binary thousand processors that outline and define my new internet and that I can use them as one cohesive supercomputer that can execute an extreme scaled high resolution global circulation model. Parallel supercomputing is a precondition to foreseeing global warming. My contribution to the development of the computer is this. I redefined the boundary of what the computer can compute. And I redefined that boundary by a factor of 65,536. I'm often asked, what are the Philip Emma Aguale equations? 
or how we are the Philip Emma Aguali equations derived. The Philip Emma Aguali equations are a system of coupled, nonlinear, time dependent, and three dimensional partial differential equations that are symbolic restatements in calculus of multi phase fluids flowing across a porous medium. The Philip M. Aguali equations encoded into calculus the second law of motion of physics. The Philip M. Aguali equations model the three phase, three dimensional flows of crude oil, natural gas, and injected water that are flowing one mile deep and flowing across an oil field that is the size of a town. I have been presenting the Philip M. Aguali equations to research mathematicians and doing so since the early 1980s. The Philip M. Aguali equations we are the cover story of the June 1990 issue of the Siam News. The Siam News is the premier publication for mathematicians. The Siam News is the flagship publication of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. The Siam News presents new mathematical knowledge as written, as written by research mathematicians for research mathematicians. I also presented the Philip M. Aguali equations at invited lectures that I delivered to research mathematicians in the United States. I delivered an invited lecture on my contributions to mathematics and I delivered that lecture to the largest international congress of mathematicians called ICM 91. That congress is the Olympics of the world of mathematics and is held once every four years. My ICM 91 lecture was at 11 in the morning of Monday, July 8, 1991 in the Dover Room of the Washington Sheraton Hotel in Washington in the District of Columbia, United States. The complete mathematical description of the invention of the Philip M. Aguale equations is posted at mrguale.com and shared at the YouTube channel of Philip M. Aguale. In summary, the Philip M. Aguale equations is akin in mathematical structure to the iconic Navier-Stokes equations that were used to design jet aircrafts and used to model the flow of blood flowing across veins and arteries. Due to its importance, the Navier-Stokes equations were used to define one of the seven millennium problems of mathematics. The system of Navier-Stokes equations own itself to the oceans, wind and fire, just like the system of Philip M. Aguale equations own itself to the injected water, crude oil, and natural gas that flows one mile deep and flows inside an oil field that is the size of a town. The differential equation plays a central role in sub-disciplines of mathematics, such as complex analysis, Lie algebra, Lie algebra and probability theory. My discovery of practical parallel processing can be extended to all boundary value problems of calculus that are governed by partial differential equations, such as Maxwell's equations of electrodynamics, diffusion equation of heat and mass transfer, Beam and plate equations of solid mechanics, lubrication theory of fluid mechanics, Hotkin Huxley equations of neurobiology, Fisher's 
and reaction diffusion equations of genetics and population dynamics, and the Black Scholes equation of financial engineering. For these partial differential equations, the time scales for discretizing and solving them range from one trillionth of a second to a thousand years, and the length scales for solving them range from the subatomic to the astronomical. The various formulations of the partial differential equations governing the flows of fluids we are almost independently derived by Claude Louis Navia, Simeon Denis Poussin, Barra de Saint-Venant, and George Stokes. Those partial differential equations were derived between 1827 and 1845. The Philip M. Aguali equations were my independent derivations of new partial differential equations that I formulated when I was a research mathematician of the early 1980s and in College Park, Maryland, United States. The Philip M. Aguali equations we are the governing equations that encoded the time-dependent and three-dimensional subterranean flows, motions, of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that flow one mile deep and across an oil field and towards production oil wells. The mathematical difference between the Navier-Stokes equations as written in the Millennium Problem of Mathematics and the Philip M. Aguali equations that is, is that the latter govern the three-dimensional, three-phase fluids flowing across a porous medium that is one mile deep and that is the size of a town. Please allow me a couple of minutes to speak only to the mathematicians in this audience. In most fluid dynamics textbooks, the Navier-Stokes equations are written in compact vector form as rho, the fluid density, times the sum of the partial of V the fluid velocity in vector with respect to the partial of t, the independent variable time. That is the change in velocity with respect to time that is called the temporal acceleration, plus the product of the fluid velocity in vector and nabla or upside down delta and the gradient operator v the fluid velocity in vector that is the convective acceleration is equal to minus nabla p the fluid pressure term that is the fluid flows in the direction of the largest change in pressure plus the product of nabla and capital t where T is the stress tensor for viscous fluids, plus F, the body forces such as wind, gravity, and electromagnetism. I stated a vector equation for each of my three phases, namely crude oil, injected water, and natural gas. That is equivalent to nine scalar equations. My unknowns were the velocity and the pressure. In three spatial dimensions, I have three equations and four unknowns, namely the pressure and the three scalar velocities. For that reason, I introduced a system of supplementary partial differential equations. Those extra partial differential equations 
encode the law of conservation of mass for the crude oil, natural gas, and injected water. Those continuity equations are the products of NABLA, or the gradient operator, and V, the fluid velocity in vector, equals zero. One of the seven millennium problems of mathematics is to prove or give a counter example of this statement. Open quote. In three space dimensions and time, given an initial velo velocity field, there exists a vector velocity and a scalar pressure field which are both smooth and globally defined that solve the Navier-Stokes equations." End quote. One million dollars will be given to the first person to prove that statement. In mathematical physics textbooks, Dealing with the subject of multi-phase fluids flowing across a porous medium, the partial derivative terms on the left-hand side of the partial differential equations that I described are non-zero. Those mathematical terms encoded both the temporal and the convective acceleration forces. By the definition of the word inertia, as the tendency of fluids in motion to remain in motion, those two inertial forces exist whenever and wherever any fluid is in motion. Yet, those two forces were erroneously zeroed in every mathematical physics textbooks of porous media flows. My contribution to mathematics that was the cover stories of top mathematics publications is this. I discovered that those egregious mathematical errors were coded and transferred into supercomputers and communicated across a tightly coupled ensemble of millions upon millions of processors that defines and outlines the modern supercomputer in expanded form for three phase three dimensional fluid flows those temporal and convective inertial terms corresponded to the 36 partial derivative terms that i invented and added to the 45 partial derivative terms that were described in mathematical physics textbooks that dealt with petroleum reservoir simulation my contribution to mathematics is this. I extended the borders of mathematical knowledge and I did so by a distance of 36 partial derivative terms that encoded the fluid dynamical processes at a distance of one mile beneath the surface of the earth. The massively parallel supercomputer that I discovered to be faster than the vector supercomputer communicated across its central processing units and therefore was not a computer per se. It was a quote-unquote virtual supercomputer that was shortened to and renamed as a supercomputer. I was in the news headlines back in 1989 because I discovered how to compute and communicate and how to do both across that virtual supercomputer that I visualized as a new internet de facto. That discovery of practical parallel supercomputing was how I redefined the boundary of what a new internet can communicate 
and redefine that boundary of human knowledge by a factor of 65,536. That discovery of the practical parallel supercomputer pushed the frontier of the internet technology and did so because it is a theoretical discovery of the internet and an idealized model of a planetary supercomputer hopeful that is a new internet. That new internet is a new global network of billions of computers. The new supercomputer that I experimentally parallel processed through is a new global network of 65,536 central processing units that I visualized as equal distances apart and on the surface of a hyperglobe embedded inside a 16-dimensional hyperspace. I use the word internet in this manner because I prefer that the technology define the name rather than the name define the technology. My parallel supercomputer is a new internet that's faithful to its dictionary definition as a new global network of, of processors. Those processors within that new internet we are tightly coupled to each other. Those processors within that new internet we are equal distances apart from each other. Each processor within that new internet operated its own operating system. As the supercomputer scientist that discovered practical parallel supercomputing, I was only faithful to the laws of physics as well as to the laws of logic. I was not faithful to Amdahl's law. Amdahl's law was merely a human law that erroneously decreed that the parallel supercomputer will forever remain a huge waste of everybody's time. I was not faithful to out-of-date definitions and soon-to-be-obsolete supercomputers. In 1989, I discovered how to experimentally parallel process and process computational fluid dynamics codes and process them through a new global network of 65,536 central processing units that I described as a new internet. I used the word internet to define the new global network of 65,536 central processing units that I theoretically discovered in the 1970s and experimentally discovered on the 4th of July 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. A long time ago, our hunter-gatherer ancestors added the fruits of their labors by counting on their fingers and toes. 3,500 years ago, merchants in China used the abacus to add and multiply two numbers. The abacus was the manual computing aid of ancient China. I was asked, what supercomputing aid could be relevant in a million or in a million years. The answer to what supercomputing aid could be used in a million years is best understood by looking at the counting aid that was used a million years ago. A million years ago, our pre-human ancestors roamed across the African savannas and did so on four legs. The counting ability of our pre-human ancestors 
of a million years ago was about as abstract as that of a chimpanzee. I believe that our post-human descendants of Yemenian will develop Yemenian supercomputers that will make them super intelligent. I believe that our post-human descendants will invent their Yemenian supercomputers that will enable them to safely travel to distant galaxies. I believe that our post-human descendants will invent a million supercomputers that will enable them to reinvent themselves as pulsating brains that are safely encased and floating in the middle and safety of the Atlantic Ocean. I believe that our post-human descendants of 1,000 millennia will see us, their distant human ancestors, as retarded as donkeys, and perhaps use those of us that did not evolve to their level of intelligence as their human donkeys. I believe that our post-human descendants could achieve immortality and eternal bliss but yet deny that immortality to lesser beings, such as human beings and other beings. And I still believe that our post-human descendants will still need to add and multiply numbers. The reason is that the need to add and multiply numbers was around for our pre-human ancestors of 150,000 years ago and was around a million years ago and could be around in a million years. In the late, in the, in the 1980s, my intellect was questioned and I was discredited by white scientists who could not understand the extremely difficult subject of how to parallel process and how to solve the toughest problems arising in science and engineering. And how to solve the toughest problems arising in science and engineering. And how to solve them across a new internet that was a new global network of millions of processors. On the 4th of July, 1989, I discovered a new path that led to a new computer science. In 1989, my 1057 page research report on the new computer science of how to parallel pro of how I parallel processed across my ensemble of 65,536 processors was rejected. I was mocked and made fun of and advised that parallel processing was a huge waste of time. The first scientist that reviewed my invention could not understand parallel processing. Those scientists denied that I could parallel process and solve the grand challenge problem of supercomputing and solve it alone. Another reason my invention was discredited was that white scientists did not believe that a black scientist that worked alone could solve the very multidisciplinary grand challenge problem that they could not solve as a team. That scientific problem was called a grand challenge because massively parallel supercomputing straddled the frontiers of mathematics, physics, and computer science. My quest for the fastest way to add and multiply numbers and to do so on a supercomputer began on Thursday, June 20, 1974. The quest began on a supercomputer that was at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, United States. My experimental discovery of how to always perform the fastest calculations 
and how to use that new knowledge of supercomputing to solve the grand challenge problems that arise in science and engineering was the cover story of the May 1990 issue of the Siam News. The acronym Siam stands for the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. The Siam News is the flagship publication of the mathematics community. My experimental discovery of how to reduce the time to solution for solving a grand challenge problem and reduce it from 180 years or 65,536 days on one isolated processor to just one day across a new internet that is a new global network of 65,536 processors entered into the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. Looking back to 1974, I learned that programming the parallel supercomputer and doing so back then was akin to the Wright brothers learning how to fly an airplane and doing so six decades earlier. Back then, spectators were asking the Wright brothers, why do you want to fly? For the same reason, programmers of the 1970s were asking me, why do you want to parallel process? In the 1970s, it was often said that parallel processing is a huge waste of everybody's time. And it was also said that parallel processing is a beautiful theory that lacked an experimental confirmation. Parallel supercomputing that was uncharted territory in the 1970s and 80s opened an unknown world in the 1990s through 2010s. Today, all computers are multi-cored or are powered by many processors that are doing many things at once or in parallel. My experimental discovery of how to speed up 108 years of sequential processing to only one day of parallel supercomputing opened the door for the manufacturing of Japanese, Chinese, and American parallel supercomputers. The reason the Japanese or Chinese or American supercomputer is one of the world's fastest is because it embodied my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing and used my new knowledge to reduce the time to solution of grand challenge problems arising in computational physics and science. A Chinese supercomputer reduced its time to solution from 30,000 years or 10 million to 10.65 10 million days of sequential processing on one isolated processor to just one day of parallel supercomputing across an ensemble of 10.65 million processors. I began my quest for the fastest arithmetical computations. I began it in June 1970 and began with an analog computer called a slide rule and began in Onicha, Nigeria. I believe that in a million years, our post-human descendants will still be searching for their fastest supercomputer that is perhaps the size of their known universe. Finally, I believe that the computing technique that was around the longest will remain around the longest. The need to add and multiply numbers was around for our pre-human ancestors of one million years ago. That need to compute at the fastest speeds could be around for our post-human descendants of year million. The research supercomputer scientist must always remain a polymath and a magician that turns science fiction 
to non-fiction. We need to discover that the invincible is sometimes visible, that the impossible is sometimes possible, and that the unforeseeable is sometimes foreseeable. That never-ending need for faster computations means that the supercomputer must be ahead of itself at all times. To invent is to create something out of nothing. We create tomorrow by what we invent today. What we don't discover will do what it wishes. And my experimental discovery of how parallel processing powers the computer and the supercomputer is how I will tell posterity that I, Chugura Philip Emma Aguale, was once here. Thank you. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. Thank you. Thank you very much. Insightful and brilliant lecture. Insightful and brilliant lecture.